Hi Tom, could you please tell us your story? How many years of experience on the market do you already have? Uh, we, too many to count. <laughs> It's getting to be 50 years now, uh, going back to when I was in 12 years old and delivering papers. So I've been trading in one form or another an awfully long time, futures probably since the early 70s. So you do the math and you're starting to get into about 50 years, uh, just shy of that probably. And just for the pure formality, we have the third occasion to uh, to talk uh, on this show. So it's really great pleasure for me to, to have you again. And now the occasion to talk again is uh, your latest book, because you have just published your latest book titled The All-Weather Trader. Could you please tell us what's inside? What's inside is sort of my view of an autobiography of my trading life and how I mentally started where I started, you know, with just like any rookie and have no idea what I'm doing and the different things that caused me those aha moments where I, I said, aha, now I understand what I have to do with this problem. And then now I have to understand what I got to do with that problem. And every I kind of went through the mentality so that traders out there could understand that I wasn't born with a knowledge of all this stuff, that it is learned skill, and that by trying to think through, trying to solve your own financial puzzle, not mine, not not yours, uh, but theirs, how how they can pick it apart <clears throat> and figure out how to add layers of good ideas to develop an a more all-weather strategy, which basically is try a fancy way of saying that you're trying to create either a strategy or multiple strategies globally that can deal with whatever the market throws at you, whether it's up market, down market, sideways markets, you're prepared to go. And I think a lot of, a lot of traders I see with the comments out there are just one side oriented. They only shorter, they only go long and, and boy, that's, Going into the trading world with one hand tied behind your back, it's tough. Uh, so I I kind of was trying to lead people through the logic and the thinking that I had to go through in my trading life to arrive where I am today. So Great. By the way, congratulations, because this book is written in a very simple way, uh, easy to understand, and uh, I appreciate that because I think... In many cases, there are good books out there, but they are just too complex to read them and to consume them, not to even mention to implement what's inside. Um, by the way, uh, because I will put all the uh, information in the show notes, is your book available on Amazon or you buy, or you're selling that through your own channel? No, it's, uh, I think it's on Amazon. It's on iBooks over at Apple. Um, it may be at other locations. I've got Scribe.com doing a lot of the distribution So I, I, I don't even know where all the places it might might be at Barnes and Nobles. I don't know if they're still uh, still around selling books, but they're uh, yeah with Ingram Sparks. They're going to be able to put out the hard copy, paperbacks, uh, the audio. The first meeting on the audio book uh, is next Wednesday, so we'll start uh, interviewing narrators. And three to four months later, we'll have an audible book ready to go. And so, yeah, this is quite the process. I, it's way beyond any other book that I've ever done. Um, Tom, so you're running uh, an extremely diversified multiple strategy, the all-weather approach strategy mm -hmm. on your, um, if I understand correctly, mostly or only retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. How does it work? I mean, any sort of advice on how to implement the all-weather approach? Yeah, I think that The first thing you have to do is look at your own equity curve and try to understand the strategies that you currently employ. Almost any trader could say, all right, here is the type of market that I really can slay it. I can make tons of money when this happens. And by the same token, that trader probably can sit back and if he's honest with himself, say, uh, you know, in this type of market, I'm going to be struggling. And, and that's pretty usually pretty easy if you understand your strategy well enough and use a little imagination. 
So to try to get to all weather, what I like to think of, and a friend of mine, Lawrence Bensdorp over in Portugal, has the greatest saying. It just hits my brain perfectly. Filling the potholes. The potholes are the drawdowns in your track record. So you've got this nice, nice smooth curve going up the page like what all of us traders would love to have. But then there's these darn potholes that come along and they test your uh, resolve and test your mind and, and push every mental button that, that known to mankind. And how can you fill that pothole? Well, the way to do it is to understand the math behind what you're already doing and try to examine those periods from the standpoint of what type of market creates those kind of drawdowns and is there a strategy that I can imagine that in that type of a period could logically make money and if I had that combined together with all these other ones that are creating the pothole maybe the pothole gets a little softer gets a little bit less uh, impactful and you're smoothing out that line so over time if you do that enough times you sort of have these independent strategies with different time periods, with different indicators, with different markets going after a smoother line going up the page. And if you uh, if you just set out as that you, that's your goal and get into the logic and really try to understand what you're doing strategy by strategy, you can pick the the uh, Achilles heel of every single strategy and you can create something that makes uh, money during those periods. A, a simple example is one thing I talk about a lot on social media is the hedging strategy. If you've got on the one part of my portfolio, uh, I'm timing some 30 sector exchange traded funds in the US. All right, if it's long only going to cash, then what are going to be my good periods? So that's going to be a bull market in the US. So I'm going to slay it. That strategy is going to make a lot of money. Where am I, am I going to, in a down market, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to go to cash and it's going to be boring. What's going to happen in a sideways market? I'm going to buy and I'm going to sell and buy and sell. There's going to be a drawdown. There's going to be hopefully small losses, but that's what I'm going to expect there. So now, if I know that in a down market, I'm going to cash and that's kind of boring. How about if I put a hedge program with it? to hedge whatever long exposure I still have to minimize any kind of drawdown that happens as we're taking those sector funds out and into cash. So I, I have a, a specific strategy called an ES futures hedge. It takes an S&P futures and it just throws it on short, never long, always short. And it uses an indicator that matches roughly the time period that I use for the sector. So I've essentially in my mind and in the math matched my hedging, which is going to make money in a down market against my sector timing, which is going to make money in an up market. And I've essentially balanced that so that uh, with the right amount of exposure, I've gotten rid of hopefully the 50% drawdown potential that you could have in some of those strategies. So that's kind of just a simple example of just keep adding and adding other strategies that logically should do something different. And what you find happening is your, your curve just smooths out. And by the way, is it all systematic, fully systematic, or there's some, uh, let's say, portion of discretionary um, decisions? No, nope, I don't use discretion. I, uh, it's all systematic in that it's methodical. I would say that out of the nine strategies I use, Three of them have yet to be automated. Six of them are fully automated. But does it happen that your gut feeling says something different what your strategy says and uh, you're struggling? Okay, maybe I will overwrite just this only one time. Yeah, I tried that back when I was about 30 years old. And after some really brutal lessons, I uh, figured out that my discretion coming in and, and playing with what I was doing is not as good as the strategy itself. I'll just let the strategy do do what it's supposed to do, and I'm a lot better off. So, yeah, I got over that a long All right. time ago. All right. Okay. And by and the uh, way, another positive thing that comes out of that is it takes a lot less time to run every day. Yeah. 
If you're yeah, sitting exactly. there agonizing over dis discretionary decision making, you could eat up a lot of time. And um, over my lifetime, I've been a very busy guy, and I'm just as busy today, it seems. Uh, some people claim I'm not retired. I'd like to think I am, but um, some people keep telling me I'm not. And uh, there's not enough time in the day to sit there and think about things like that. So I uh, run it, run it, and get All it right. done and move on to other things. You have dedicated the whole chapter in your book uh, where you explain what is a complete trading strategy. Could you please just uh, quickly explain us what is a complete strategy? Because quite often people think that the strategy is when it says you just buy and they are just focusing on that moment when to buy, of course, uh, to buy the, the, the dip and they think they will do it and that's it. But yeah. you, you, you see it totally different. Uh, could you please yeah, explain? I do, and I've actually done a lot of studies along that to prove to myself uh, that what I'm about to say makes sense to me. Um, first of all, you have to have something that triggers your action. So trying to discretionarily just look at a bunch of stocks, let's say, and look at the fundamentals and then say, mm, you know, there's good value in XYZ. I'm going to try to pick it up over the next five days. That's very, very open-ended, nebulous. You're not sh sure what you're supposed to be doing. You're kind of looking to buy it. Well, all right, why, how about buying it like now? How about buying it an hour from now? Tomorrow, maybe. That's kind of, you're just killing time and you're causing yourself a lot of stress. So buy, sell, engine, and the reason I use the word engine is engines move something. They move the car, they move the, you know, the, uh, whatever. If you, so buy, sell engine implies it's moving the trader to take action, buying or selling. And the reason I say buy, sell engine is a lot of people have a mentality of we buy stocks and then we sell them and go to cash. I like to open the, the, the discussion up to how about if we sell stocks and then buy them later, maybe go short. Maybe go short a futures index contract or maybe look at a long short program in uh, commodity futures or currencies or FX or there's just so many different markets out there. That if you open up yourself to thinking that markets move up and down and I, whenever they move, if I can be in on them, that's a potential profit, then a buy sell engine is what you need to take action. The second part, and very, very critical, and more important mathematically, according to my studies, than the buy-sell engine, which everybody wants to concentrate on when they start out, including me, when I started out, I concentrated on buy-sell engine, is the position sizing. If you don't have your position sizing dialed in properly, uh, you're going to take on too much leverage or not enough leverage. You're going to be looking at uh, trying to change the bet size on any one trade. So you're, you're looking at this corn trade and saying, I'm going to double my position norm that I normally do because this is set up so perfectly. Look at that chart pattern. It's tested the bottom. We have a nice W going on. It's breaking out and everything's lined up. And then the next trade you're looking at it and saying, ah, oh, the risk is too high and I, you know, I don't feel comfortable. I'm just going to override this trade and not do it. That leads to very, very erratic performance. Any study I've ever done shows that you've got to get a consistent sort of bet size going, you know, trade after trade over your next 1,000 trades. Then the statistics start working in your advantage, and you'll find that the position sizing has more impact as you dial it in than does the buy-sell engine. The reason is... The buy-sell engine, no matter whether I use a moving average, whether I use a Keltner breakout or a Donchin or whatever, the trend and a very long trend that lasts for, say, six months or a year is going to make so much profit on that one trade. It may be the difference between losing that year and making money that year in your trading. I've had years where that happened. If you have that kind of impact, does it really make any difference whether the Keltner has told you to get in today and the moving average was tomorrow? You're talking about the next nine months or something. You don't really care. You don't have to be that precise with your buy-sell engine. 
But if you screw up how much you expose to that trade with your position sizing, now you've got really big impact and you've got to be careful to not overdo it or underdo it. The third area that you've got to have in a complete trading strategy is, is you've got to figure out if you're doing stocks and you're doing those types of um, instruments, even ETFs, you've got to figure out how to screen your positions that you're potentially going to trade. So, for instance, if I'm moving like I was in the day, uh, $600 million of other people's money, I might not go in and buy an ETF uh, that is trading you know, 500 shares a day. If you're an individual, you have an advantage over the institution because you're trading smaller amounts of money and you can go like I do now. I go, I've made a lot of money recently off of orange juice futures. Back in Trendstat days, I really couldn't consider trading uh, orange juice futures because I'd move the market. So you end up having to dial in. You have to understand each of your instruments and it's their shortcomings and their advantages and their taxable consequences and their liquidity. So screening becomes an important function. And then last, I think another big area, and you could get into all sorts of subtlety, other little things, but I think the mental side, you've got to have the plan for how to deal with yourself and your own psyche. You have to deal with interruptions. Uh, if you're a day trader and as I've often said in the examples, uh, you know, the nurse at school calls and your child is sick and in the uh, nurse's office and needs to get picked up uh, because they're not going to have any more school today. And you're in the middle of a trade and, oh my God, the whole world, you're like, what am I supposed to do now? Well, you should have already planned for what you should do. Mm. Life is going to throw those things at you. Life's going to turn the power off and you're all of a sudden all your lights are going to go blank. Do you have a backup generator? Do you have battery power? What happens when your internet goes down? Can you do a hotspot off your phone with cellular to give yourself some backups? If that doesn't work, is there a place that has reliable dedicated internet that you could go to like a local grocery store or a cafe that would have internet where you could take your laptop and continue to proceed? Can you call up your broker and blow out of the trade that you're in? Those should be pre-wired and, and ready to go at a moment's notice. And if you do that, your stress levels go away because you already have a plan. You know, hey, all right, internet goes down. That can go into, you know, plan B now. Plan B, I do this, 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 and everything's fine. And you move on. And the next day, the internet's on again. You're back to normal. It, we used to at Trendstat run what I called disaster days, where we would run the company from a backup location on laptops and a different internet system. And we just presumed that the office was destroyed in a tornado or something and we had to scramble. And I'd take about half of the crew with me to the backup location and I would usually be there at that location. And then we'd leave a skeleton crew back at Trendstat's offices to run parallel. And we'd uh, be talking to each other just about all day long on what was going on at both places and what we were writing down ideas and learning. But I think that really reduces stress levels and it allows you to be a Mr. Serenity because you've covered the vast majority of everything that could happen. So you're not really worried about much. So right, right. that would be a complete trading strategy. If you had all those things put together then I think you're truly prepared to go into battle each day. So your definition is much more broader than probably many people think about strategy when they just focus only on the buying signal. Correct. By the way, in your book, I found a very nice phrase. I will just quote it. You can't control the wind, but you can adjust your sails. I really like that. Could you please um, explain what does it mean? in the context of, of market well, timing. It, it, just like we were talking a little earlier, <clears throat> let's say if you're an upside oriented trader and you just always go long and you always go long stocks, let's say, then you're looking for a stock that is forming a base and up it goes. Well, you might be in the middle of a bear market, so that might be a very difficult time sailing into the wind, but you could just as easily adjust the sales and say, Hmm. You know, the market's in a down funk and it might be there for a year or two. Economies look lousy. 
maybe I'll start exploring ways of exploiting some of those downside moves. And that's, to me, adjusting your sales. You're, you're letting the markets do whatever the markets want to do and not pre like superimposing your views that you always have to be locked into this one mentality. Think about adjusting your sales and letting the wind take you that direction. Uh, you know, with the wind behind you, it's a whole lot easier. <laughs> so um, You say in your book that it took you four years to have your first profitable uh, year. Yeah. Is it so difficult to learn trading or uh, basically... You, you actually even mentioned that it was a kind of a four-year degree in the University of Trading for you. But uh, yeah. not everyone probably has so much, you know, um, persistence to, to spend four years and having losses maybe even during that time. Do you, are there any, I don't, I don't want to use maybe this word shortcut, but are there any easy ways to, 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 to learn it properly from the very beginning? Well, I think the world has changed a great deal since... I took on that task of four or five years of getting to, you know, making money. Uh, remember that back in the 70s, we didn't even have uh, IBM PCs out yet. So we were working with calculators and pieces of paper. And um, cell phones were these big blocks that uh, cost a lot of money. But most people didn't have those. So you had landlines. You eventually got fax machines, which was unbelievable technology. And then, uh, you know, in 1980 or so, you finally got some uh, PCs starting to come in. Internet rates were you know, like 4,000 baud, not 4 megabips, 4,000. It took forever to pull down data, send orders, whatever. So I think in today's world, for instance, just go on the Enjoy the Ride uh, world uh ETR website and this interview will eventually be on there so you could watch this interview and learn a tremendous amount of how I had to go through and struggle and strain because I didn't have any internet to go listen to Tom Basso talk about trading um, you had to figure it out on your own it was a lot more difficult so I would say traders today have a lot more resources if they want to study it and, and do it you know my book I didn't have any all-weather trader book to read when I was starting out that could uh, give me some wonderful ideas, hopefully, about, hey, maybe I ought to try this, maybe I ought to try that. Hey, that looks like an interesting study that he's quoting. Had nothing like that. So I had to create this image in my mind of some sort of a super trader that always did everything right. He always... You know, every trade was perfect. Uh, there, he executed it flawlessly. He managed his position sizes perfectly. He didn't let his emotions get in, in the way of the trading whatsoever. And I always had to rate myself as a human being and a trader against super trader, this image of what would be perfect. And even the image of super trader had to change over time as I learned different things that were important to do. I had to make Super Trader even better than he was when he started out. Uh, but I always had something to shoot for and something to get better at. And that's kind of the way I tried to ramp it all up. So it took four or five years because I'm just kind of struggling along the way. I think today's world, if you wanted to start out from scratch and watch interviews like this one or read the book that I just wrote, or others, you know, I'm not saying I've got the only good book out there. Uh, you know, I, I love a number of books, and I did a recommended reading list on EnjoyTheRide.World for traders looking to, to see what I would recommend you, that you read to get started. And I think that um, once you do that, you're so far ahead of where I would have been uh, just struggling and straining to figure this stuff out. And fortunately, I was an engineer, and I could keep track, track of a lot of data and I could analyze it mathematically and statistically to try to come up with what I felt were truisms that I could then incorporate into what I was doing and then get better and better. But uh, boy, nowadays the resources, the internet, this stuff that I've written 30, 40 years ago is still floating around the internet. It's amazing. So... Yes. So indeed, from one side, it's a great help. On the other side, 
I wanted to ask you about um, optimizing, finding the perfect parameters to our system strategy, because uh, people are willing to find a perfect strategy. And now with the powerful computers, we can easily, you know, fit the data to the past performance. How do you approach that? How do you optimize a strategy? Or do you just set the fixed uh, parameters and you don't touch them? The way I approach simulations and optimization and all that, that's an excellent question. You always ask good questions. <laughs> Thank um, you. The, uh, the way I approach that is the first problem you're trying to solve is sort of how many trades do you want out of the strategy? What kind of moves are you looking to exploit? What kind of risk are you looking to get rid of? And that sort of crystallizes your thinking on, is this going to be a strategy where I trade once a month? Is it going to be one where I trade every other day? You know, am I going to be setting profit targets or I'm going to let it ride with a trend following type of an approach? What am I trying to do? I think it's very important, and a lot of people do not do this, to create objectives for that strategy. It's got... It's like having, in my case, nine different kids. Each kid has got a different personality and has a different kind of goal or objective in their life, what they're supposed to be doing at any point in time. And they're not all going to be doing the same thing. I've got, I've got right today, I've got situations, I, I trade almost 30 different futures markets, and I've got probably five to 10 that have one strategy long, a certain number of contracts, and another strategy short, a certain number of contracts. They both know what they're doing, and they both are picking up different time periods, different things they're trying to exploit, but it turns out they're doing them exactly opposite right now. And I did, by the same token, I've got other markets in those same two strategies where they are both lined up the same way, so I have a much bigger aggregate position But if you drill down to each, they're both doing their own thing. And if they just happen to line up, that's fine. If they want to go the opposite direction, that's fine as well. There's times when they go in the opposite direction, it takes me to zero and I don't have a position. That's okay too. They're both doing what they're supposed to do. So I think that that's, that, that's far more important than running a hundred different parameters through an optimization program and finding out that 57 days is actually the best result and then thinking, deluding yourself into thinking that I should run 57 days because that's the best that this uh, strategy can do. What you'd <clears throat> rather do is to come up with something general and say, you know, something around 50 days is sort of two and a half months That's kind of the time period I'm looking to exploit. And whether it's 50, 51, 49, 48, shouldn't make that much difference if you've done your homework right. And I think people become obsessed with the technology and just kind of misusing it to run a thousand different examples of every possible combination of five parameters and filters And they run the thing overnight and come back the next morning and think they have the perfect answer. And what they're doing is, by doing that, they're building a lack of robustness into their strategy. Uh, example, if you just take a simple moving average to make a, a simple example here, and I don't know, 20 day against a 50 day, something simple, 10 day against 50, something. You take that and you just pull that out of the air. Now, if you run it, and you find out that it's really 13 against 57 would be your optimum uh, parameter. You have just reduced the, the reliability and robustness of that because you put an extra degree of restriction on how that strategy goes with what comes next. You are fighting the last battle, not the next one. And that's what traders need to think about. And Every time you start taking multiple stra uh, multiple parameters and then running every possible combination of all those, you're reducing your robustness even more. So try to keep your parameter sets extremely small and don't over-optimize them. Gear them towards the velocity that you want to exploit, the types of moves you want to exploit, types of risk you want to avoid. 
qualitatively put that in place rather than just run a bunch of numbers. And by the way, do you have any view on artificial intelligence? We can hear recently quite many things about it. Do you see any application of artificial intelligence in trading, for example? Well, I do in, uh, in a way that would not be uh, what a lot of people would expect me to say. Uh, first of all, let's ask ourselves, what is artificial intelligence? So you and I and a bunch of other programmers get together and we create code. And the code goes against massive databases that of data that's been collected out on the web in all sorts of different places. So we give the AI bot, if you will, the ability to go out and just peruse the entire internet for any kind of information. So if you ask a bot, who is Tom Basso, uh, money manager or trader, you would get several paragraphs on my life, but it would be picked up from just stuff that's on the web. So if, if something on the web is incorrect and I've had, I've had stuff on, um, oh, what's the, what's the encyclopedia, Wikipedia, I guess it's called. Wikipedia. You read my page there. There's actually flawed information there. I don't even know how to go in and change it. I don't really care. But if this bot that we just created went off and read the Wikipedia page on me, it would have that same incorrect information. It would also have a lot of stuff that was right as well. Yeah. So you get this stuff back and it's only good as what the collection of everything out there is. And it's the bot itself is just running programs that we've created. So it's mindless. It's, you want to think when somebody says artificial intelligence, you want to think stupid, stupid monkey looking at whatever out there is, is out there floating around the web. And some of it is absolute garbage and that's being condensed down and fed back to you. So take everything with a grain of salt and, and check it out yourself before you believe AI. Now where you could use AI in trading and I've seen it done effectively and I've seen it done uh, numerous times uh, recently because AI would also have knowledge of how to program in say Python or program in C sharp. If, uh, if Tom wants to go uh, and create strategy number 10 and he can articulate to the AI bot, could you write me a C sharp uh, code to do this following indicator, which can be found in Investopedia with a formula of this. And I'm going to feed you the open, high, low, close, and the variable names will be M open, M high, M low, and M close. And I need you to return to me whether I'm on a buy or sell and what the price would be for my stop order and whatever. And son of a gun, the AI will generate your code for you. Now that would be very useful for you as a human being to direct what the AI monkey, the dumb monkey is doing to help you leverage yourself by running that code where a lot of people are going to misuse AI. And I think it's going to be a misuse of it is to have the AI actually tell you based on whatever the AI thinks where to buy and sell. I think that'll be a big mistake. And if people do that, I think they're kidding themselves because that will be so over restrictive and based on historical uh, force fitting of facts that have happened in the past that it will not be able to easily handle uh, wrinkles in the future that'll be totally different than the past. So uh, I think that would be a misuse of AI. I hope that explains the difference yeah. between the two ways. So use it as a tool to help yourself get to where you want to be, but don't rely on AI to tell you where you want to buy and sell. By the way, I remember from our last discussion that your origins are from Italy and I saw somewhere in the news that Italy, in Italy, the government is thinking about uh, imposing some restrictions on AI because it's using some personal data and, you know, it can be used in a wrong way. So probably we will need some, probably some regulations. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, indeed, it as, as you say, I I, I share the the view you, you you just explained that it may be used as a good tool, but also mm -hmm. we have to be careful because 
it's not like uh, it, it's just taking the, the knowledge out of the blue. I mean, it just uses what it's already there. I tell you, an easy way to explain this to everyone, if you want to think about human endeavor, there's two aspects in normal everyday life for everybody out there. There's the repetitive. So in the trader sense, since this is an interview on trading, it would be the, uh, you know, calling up your broker or hitting the screen and putting in a buy stop at this price and it's GTC and you hit the transmit button. That is something that as a trader, you might do a thousand times in the next six months. Very routine, same way every time. Then there's the other aspect of trading, which is I'm going to invent a new strategy that exploits this one period that I struggle with my existing strategies. That is the total creative mind of a human being using everything he or she can pull together and then coming up with some brilliant solution that captures that, you know, puzzle and tries to figure it out. If you can break everything you do down into routine, I do it the same way every day, and creative, this is all paving new ground. The AI side of it can execute more logically the routine. It cannot at all, and I would not trust it to, do the creative. That's got to be human beings right yeah. now. I don't, there's yeah. no way that you can convince me that AI could be creative. I see it the same way. I mean, I know that I'm also a programmer engineer. Many things can be automated. Mm -hmm. As you said, it can be a routine. But mm -hmm. if you need to be really creative, you need to create something, then I don't see how AI could could um, replace us. Cannot happen right now. I, and I don't know if it ever will. I can't imagine with technology that I'm aware of that it could happen. Yeah. Um, uh, Tom, I know that from the very beginning, or correct me if I'm wrong, you are mostly the trend follower. And this is the, the, the main strategy. Of course, it's not the only one, but this is the main uh, pillar, let's say. Mm -hmm. I also remember from our previous discussion, and also you mentioned that at the beginning today, that you're not very um, believing in buy and hold strategy where you buy, buy for example, the whole market, the, the, let's say S&P 500, and you just keep it forever. And this is so-called passive invest, investing. Um, this is what Jack Bogle, for example, back in the 70s when he opened the first index fund, uh, he popularized. Uh, what kind of problems do you see with such approach? Do you, do you think it's totally unacceptable or it's maybe more difficult than it seems to be because it's so attractive that you buy something and you keep it forever, but there are some difficulties on the way? So I think the human beings are basically lazy. I, I like to just lie around by the pool and do nothing as much as everybody else out there. And so in investing, it's very interesting when studies come out and say, you know, if you just bought this and held it for the last 50 years, you'd be ahead of all these other approaches. But then you dial into that 50 year track record, which now has these little tiny potholes in it, little drawdowns. But when you drill down to the number and you do the calculation, that was 40% down at that point in time. So what I find happening is people get lazy and they say, well, you know, you make, if you just buy and hold, you know, the market does what it does, you're just fine. And then you ask them, okay, well, what happens in the 1920s when the market makes new lows in the crash of 29 and into 30, you're in a worldwide depression and you don't get back to break even for about 10, 12 years or, or beyond. How is that going to feel to you? Are you going to minus be able to 80. Stay with your, and that's where it all falls apart. And that, so all the math looks great. But the reality is, as a money manager, I had real live clients. And if I went into even a sometimes a 10% drawdown, and that's not that much, you know, by historical standards, with the stock market being down 50% in years like 73, 74, being down 20 something percent in one day on October 19th back in 87. I mean, these are real live, I mean, tech stocks in 2000 bubble 
crash uh, of tech stocks, 80% down was common. Who is going to stick around to enjoy the other side of it when it comes all the way back up? That's going to be one out of 100 people, maybe. 99 of them are going to say, I'm done. Get rid of this. So the strategy falls apart because the actual human beings and all of us come in and put a stop to the buy and hold. So with all due respect to Bogle and all those buy and holders out there, I just don't see normal people putting up with it. So it won't happen. So how do you explain the outflows from the active mutual funds into the passive index funds? Because we still see it over the years. Uh, the passive uh, is an easy solution. And especially until, say, about a year and a half ago, the passives were riding with the wind at their back. Uh, the last year and a half, maybe not so much, although the last week or two, it looks like it's pretty strong again uh, at the time that we're doing this interview. So market goes through various moods that it, that favor the index funds. And the index funds are so inexpensive that they have a cost advantage. They may have a liquidity advantage even in some cases. And so it's an easy sort of, I don't have to think too hard. If you're trying to say with an active manager, do I want active manager A, B, C, D, E? I've got to select. They have different strategies and one of them's really hot right now and you're, you are kind of feel like, oh, I'd love to give this guy money because he's really uh, doing a much better return than these other people. But then, of course, they forget about the fact that because he's so fast, he goes down just as fast maybe when the strategy doesn't, uh, it goes against him uh, and the markets uh, give his strategy a tough way to go. So you get these frustrations of, I picked manager A, but that didn't work out. He lost me a bunch. So I picked manager B. So he did really well for about three months and then he lost me a bunch of money. Screw this. I'm just going to go buy an index fund. And uh, that's kind of a, a last, that's the last stop before going to screw this. I'm going to go buy a CD at the bank or uh, put it in money market funds or buy a uh, 30 year treasury or whatever. They finally get so frustrated. They don't even want to have anything to do with any market that moves up and down. And that that's an example of what I call in the book sort of passively hiding from risk or trying to hide from risk, but risk still finds you. It's easier to examine the risk and attack it to actually go after the risk because you're in control somewhat at that point and you're empowered to do something about those things that you know are going to affect your psyche, are going to make you nervous, make you shut down the strategy, do all the wrong things at the wrong time. If you attack risk, you'll have less tendency to do that because you feel like you're in control and you are managing that risk better. And do you see any risk for the whole market as such uh, from the side of passive funds? Because now, for example, even more than 50% of the capital is allocated to such funds. Mm -hmm. Do you see certain problems maybe in the future on the way uh, because too much capital will flow into such passive uh, vehicles. All, all it's going to take is uh, another 1973-74, a bear market. I mean, if you think back to what was happening then, we had stagflation. It was during the Carter administrations. Um, we had inflation, but we had a stagnating economy. It's kind of what we have a little bit right now around the world. Uh, it could easily degrade over the next year. I don't see with higher interest rates uh, being a drag on everything and inflation still fighting its way into the numbers all the time. It could easily, we could even, you know, have it start caving in emotionally. People sell it off. You got a lot of money in the index funds, so they sell out of the index funds as they're getting beat up. And it just exacerbates this flow of money out of the index funds. and. Where they go from there, who knows? Uh, Short-term money, gold. Uh, I just talked to a gold broker last night, actually. And um, she was in the marketing department of that firm. 
uh, and she said that their normal purchases of gold in the past month or so ago were running about two million dollars a week is what they moved in their company and it turns out that as of the bank failures the last two weeks they've been averaging seven to eight million dollars a day or eight million dollars a week I mean so they've quadrupled roughly the amount of people that are putting money into gold based on the bank failures well that same kind of thing could happen with index funds so I I think index funds do not have any risk protection so if you you're exposing yourself to a 50 percent down on a bear market and if you're relying off of that for retirement uh, good luck with that you're going to really put some mental pressure on yourself to uh, stay the course and put up with that um, by the way you mentioned about the 70s i know that all your decisions are fully systematic but do you really think that the uh, what we see now is similar to the 70s and that we may have like let's say a lost decade for example now so that's why for example the passive portfolios will struggle a lot yeah i i think as my f favorite saying usually says the market will do whatever the market will do um it the markets tend to find a way to fool most people most traders <laughs> And those lucky few that figure out each of the markets that come along uh, do well and the rest uh, get locked into thinking that uh, this is going to be like 73, 74, or it's going to be like 1980, or it's going to be like 1987 coming out of the crash or out of the COVID or whatever. And I think there's always similarities, but the market likes to do stuff that's different all the time. And uh, that's why over-optimizing doesn't work. It really, you're using data that existed, that played out in a certain sequence. And the next year or two will play out in a different sequence. It just never does exactly the same thing that it did before. So I would say, is it possible to do a lost decade? Absolutely. But it doesn't have to be like the 1970s. It could be like the 2020s. You know, and yeah. it, it, it'll have different wrinkles. It'll have different causes. It'll, you know, there'll be these subtleties that'll be out there that will throw certain traders some wrinkles they weren't expecting. If they're mentally locked onto, this is 1970, and so therefore I'm going to play this exactly like I played 1970. And I think that's what you have to keep in mind as a trader, that, that it's always really in the market. The market's going to always do what it wants to do. I. I've been thinking, why is this market, you know, I just took the hedges off yesterday. I, I'm long some sector funds having a good day again. Like I think five days in a row, uh, I'm looking at profits here. You know, I wouldn't have expected that. You know, if I was discretionarily trying to figure out what to do, I would not have expected what I've seen in the last five days. But the market does what the market wants to do. And um, your job yeah. as a trader is to sort of stay... Uh, I think the word agno agnostic is a good one. Uh, just you don't have an opinion of whether it's going up or down from trading viewpoint. Now, as a citizen of the world, I have lots of opinions and lots of uh, economic thoughts about w what politicians and bankers and everything should be doing to assist an economy to go along and, uh, and create economic wealth around the world. I have very opinionated there. However, from a trading standpoint, each day when I come in, I don't know whether the market's going to go up or down. I almost don't care. I've got indicators that are measuring it. I let the indicators feed me the buy sell trades. I put them in. They're, you know, the computer sends in a lot of them. You know, I it is what it is. The market will uh, just feed me my profits over time. I my job is to do the next 1000 trades. In other words, enjoy the ride. <laughs> enjoy the ride. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you the last question um, sure. before we will end. Um, I know that maybe managing a, a futures portfolio may be a bit overwhelming for an average person. Mm -hmm. Although maybe it's a matter of person, but 
wanted to ask you a question because recently there are ETFs which are basically replicating what the hedge funds, uh, even trend following hedge funds are doing. For example, there's a ETF uh, with the ticker DBMF. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any opinion on such vehicles? And by the way, um, the founder of the DTF is saying that the purest form of alpha is the cost reduction and they are offering the DTF, I, I don't recall, but just before 1% per, per, per year. Mm -hmm. And they say that this is the, the source of their, uh, let's say, advantage as well. Uh, certainly cost reduction is absolute alpha. When we did Standpoint um, Multi-Asset Fund, which I'm the chairman of the fund company, I'll disclaim that right out of the gate, um, Eric uh, was conscious to try to keep the cost down as low as he could to um, make the company profitable, but also to trade 75 different futures markets and also have equity exposure in there blended in 50-50 roughly. Uh, and there's lots of different types of wrinkles, these other funds that are creating mutual funds that are doing, you know, similar or different things, but they're, they're getting into the alternate universe. And so they're useful for people who only have access to those types of um, positions. So if you've got $10,000 and you want to buy an alternative fund, you're going to be in the mutual fund world. There's just not going to be much other uh, way to go. You running your own futures account with say $5,000 or $10,000, you could do it, but you're going to end up with five or six positions instead of like, I'm trading 30. Who's got the better diversification? You know, so uh, in this instance, it's difficult to put together even with micro futures, which has been a very beneficial thing to the small investor. You know, if you've got eh, 30 to 50,000, I think you can start thinking about doing your own portfolio and you can make it cookbook enough to where it doesn't take a lot of your time and there's enough platforms that you can start using to uh, do some testing and to maybe generate some orders or you know like you said you're a coder you can do you know so a lot of the guys out there that you know came up through the programming world you could either hire a programmer or learn programming yourself there's courses online for fifteen dollars where you can learn basic Python code or basic C sharp code. So there's, um, I wasn't born with a knowledge of computer programming and you weren't either. You had to learn it and all right, well, take some time and learn it. It's a useful skill. Just like knowing how to cook a meal maybe might be a useful skill. Um, it's, it's something you learn to do. And I think that that, I think what what's going to happen out there with uh, uh, some of these funds is they're going to have a lot of money under management where they've got to watch very carefully that they don't get so much capital in there. They can't really execute their strategy anymore. Uh, Eric estimates at standpoint that we can get up to approximately three to four billion and we're at about 570 million right now as of yesterday, I think. And, uh, you know, three to four billion is a long way. Uh, you could get there in a year or two, but uh, we're not at concern over the capacity because he's built the strategy around what he was trying to create. Uh, and I don't know to what extent these other operations have done that. So they may be trading orange juice now when they're small, and then when they you know get billions under management, they have to drop orange juice out. Those types of uh, situations come into play. So. I think check them out. It's an alternative, but if you've got thirty to fifty thousand, you probably can start thinking about using the micro futures contracts to do your own thing. And then you just got to go through the pain of learning a little bit more about futures, just like you would to learn the pain about you know investing in stocks. This is none of this. Are you born with knowledge of? You have to you know read some books or ask some questions of guys like me that have been trading futures for 50 years and uh, they do it about as easy as I breathe. So you just have to, you have to kind of figure out uh, what's step one, get a book on futures. Step two, ask Tom a question about futures or whatever. And, you know, little by little you come up the curve and pretty soon you're seasoned. Thank you, Tom, very much. I would like to recommend once again to everyone the All Weather Trader book, uh, the latest book by Tom. It's really 
a great read and it's very easily understandable. So very practical book, highly recommended. Thank you, Tom, for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you again. It's always best. a pleasure. Always a pleasure. You ask such good questions. Thank you very much. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.